Being a superhero is bad for your health. Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Tool up, honey bunny. Oh, yeah. Good morning, good morning, good morning. This is Project Eternity Multimedia Bible Study, and we are here again this wonderful Wednesday morning. I hope you guys are doing well, and um, and you're praying for all the victims of Hurricane Dorian. Um, don't just pray for them. Uh, pray for the victims of society, uh, everybody. I mean, we have been lied and deceived on so many levels that we would not even begin to believe it. So this morning, get your prayer on for the world and pray for these families out here who are under attack. There's a lot going on in the world, a lot going on in the world. But in lieu of that, good morning to the Project Eternity panel. I know you guys are, are right here um, making it do what it do in the name of Jesus. I know you are. This morning, we got um, a wonderful story um, from InTouch.org. That's right, this will be Dr. Stanley's uh, daily devotional, and we'll be coming from Acts 10. Acts 10, yeah, that's right, Acts 10. So um, without further ado, let's, um, let's get to some word. Brother Max McLean, everybody, Brother Max McLean. Acts 10. There was a certain man, Caesarea, called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian Band, a devout man, and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people, and prayed to God always. He saw in a vision, evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming into him, and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid, and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa, and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodgeth with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. Uh, let's just take a look right there, if you don't mind, gentlemen. So there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius. Let's see. And Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band. I mean, is it is that a, like a band? <laughs> is, that a, is there an, that's what they call the army back then? Was that were those soldiers, the Italian band of soldiers? I guess it would have to be. That's not a musical band. Stop it, Kelvin, this morning. So this is a, um, a group of soldiers called the Italian, the Italian band. A devout man and one that feared God. See, I'm already trying to see how I measure up to these things. A devout man is a man of God and feared God. You know, you're going to we go through a lot in life where these subjects come up. If you're a Christian seeking the truth, um, you'll see these uh, reoccurring um, situations or statements um, or themes fear of God fear of God is a sign of a true Christian fear now men will tell you what that doesn't mean at least they will try to say what it doesn't mean they'll try to say what well, doesn't really mean fear it's more so you know a reverence no the word says fear just like f five words down it says house that don't mean a hole in the ground. That's going to mean a house. So a devout man and one that feared God with all his house. So what does it mean to fear God with all your house? Can anybody help me with that? If, if, if you might know to fear God with all your house. I heard of men fearing God with all their heart. But this man feared the Lord so much that he feared God with all his house. Anybody? Well, I would have to believe that to fear God with all your house means that you have taught everyone in your home to fear God. 
you have taught the word and shared the word so much in your house where now the whole house fears God. All right, a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people. And for those who don't know, alms are offerings, uh, not tithes. Alms are gifts, offerings. Um, so he, this guy gave alms, much alms to the people and prayed to God always. So let me look at my own character. Um, am I a devout man? meaning a man of God? Um, do I fear God? Now, have I feared God with all my house? Almost. <laughs> Still some corners need to be addressed, but that's definitely a mission. Um, do I give much alms? I, I, I try to give some alms. Uh, much alms is probably not going to describe me, so I'm going to be fair and say I, don't, I give alms um, when I'm moved to. But that wouldn't equate to much arms. And do I pray always? I don't pray always either. So I see some things I need to work work on right here in, in, in verse two. Um, and why am I picking this verse to 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 measure myself by? Because God liked this man. God uh, is 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 he, he this man is so interesting that he's in the word and God came to see this man. So. I'm trying to move in that direction. He saw a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius. Um, people are still having visions today. And a vision uh, may not be a physical occurrence. I, I think it's metaphysical. I believe just like John had the vision of being caught up into heaven and he got all of that information. You know, there's this place where you're still in your physical, but you're you're metaphysical. You've been taken into a spiritual realm where God wants to communicate with you rather than him. Just like he did Paul on the road. He didn't go metaphysical with Paul. He just said, hey, man, why are you killing my people? Paul wouldn't didn't fall into a trance and a vision and see God saying that. No, that happened verbatim to Paul. It was a literal um, situation or occurrence where the Lord came to Paul, just like the Lord came to the disciples after he was resurrected. He was not in a vision. He was there. But here we have people being people who see a vision and God will communicate with people in visions. So he saw a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day of day, an angel of God coming to him saying Cornelius. And when he looked uh, when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? And he said unto him, the prayers, thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. Listen up, people. Your actions and your your obedience to God's word, the kindness and the love of your heart can come up. This is proof can come up for a memorial before God. You guys know what a memorial is. It's, 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 there is a 911 memorial to to observe and, and pay homage and and respect to those who failed, to show love to those who suffered. Uh, there are veterans memorials to show, to show love and affection and support for those who died in the military. You can do things that come up before the Lord as a memorial. And that's not a, a fleshly memorial. That's an eternal memorial. I can almost imagine us being in heaven and we go to the memorial section, <laughs> you know, and you can see the memorial of of, of Kay Little helping the, the children and, and Aunt Frances helping the older people and, and Corey preaching to the people of God out of his heart that the, memo the things that you've done in the name of Jesus and not in your own name come up before God. So this this is something that that is proof. It happens. 
it happens. Uh, gentlemen, you got anything on that? Ding, 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 ding. Okay. And now send men to Joppa. These are the instructions. And call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodgeth with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. And he shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. So God comes or the angel of the Lord comes and gives instructions to the man of God. The man of God has to determine whether he's going to do it or not. How many times has God sent you to take the lady's trash out next door? How many times has God sent you to feed the hungry? God has asked you and, and commanded you to do this thing and the other thing. And you let something rise up inside of you to convince you not to do it. God communicates in such a way. So he has his marching orders. And when the angel which spake unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier of them that awaited on him continually. Let's keep it moving. And when the angel which spake unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. And when he had declared all these things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened, and a certain vessel descending unto him, as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners, and let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill, and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. This was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. Now while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. Wow. So, we got God working in two men at one time. So God gets Cornelius set up to go on the mission. Then he calls, he, he causes Peter to fall into a trance and gives him a vision. And the vision Peter gets, God is, God is preparing Peter for something he doesn't normally do. Something outside of what he's normally commanded to do. So he falls into a trance and he sees all these animals and creeping things and fowls of the air. And he's told to eat it, kill it and eat it. And Peter's like, mm -mm, that ain't what we normally do. And the Lord corrected him. No, you're going to do this right here. Don't call common. It's not unclean. What I have made is not clean. So wherein we wherein were all men are four footed beasts of the of the earth. And wild beasts, creeping things, and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord. Ooh. I mean, <laughs> how many times God told you to do so and do something, and you turned around and say, Not so, Lord. Wow. For I have eaten, I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. Ladies and gentlemen, I introduce to you pride. In one of his one of his rare forms, I have never eaten anything common or unclean. Even in society today, we have these vegans and vegetarians and this, that. And it's and it's and it's a pride of I haven't eaten that or I only eat this. And, you know, that kind of thing. There's nothing wrong with being healthy. But we can see the oversaturation of, of that which is called vegan or vegetarian or these special food situations um, that make us feel like we're on a higher level. We're doing better than that guy who's eating that pork chop, fried pork chop sandwich, you know. Um, yes, sir. 
I'm I'm kind of stuck on that. I mean, I, I understand what unclean, but I'm trying to in the in the context of this, well, what's common? Um, it, I mean, were there common things that they ate back then, or? Well, um, the Jews did not. They they. What is the word they they use? They they drank blood from their meat. Um, they did a lot of things to prepare their food that was different from the rest of the world. These are the chosen people, so they didn't eat the way the rest of the world eat. They did not eat pig. They did not do a lot. They did not eat shellfish. They did not do a lot of things. So you- Go ahead. You can almost, almost like call them the vegetarians or the vegans. <laughs> <laughs> the first veg, the first vegans to ever be known. <laughs> yeah, they they were special people. They were a peculiar people. God made them that way. So everything they did was different from the world. It's it's really a mirror of how the church body is supposed to be today. There's supposed to be a clear distinction between us and the world. And that example is given in the Jews. God set them aside to teach what set aside-ness means, if that could be a word this morning, to teach us the ways of being different, of not being like the world. So God is asking Peter to do something that um, traditionally was something that Jews did not do. And so God didn't get mad when Peter said not so, you know, I, I try to make myself uh, the person that when God say go do it, I, I don't I can't see myself saying not so. I already know, you know, all things. I have no reason to reject any commandment you give to me is whether I have the courage to do it. So I have never eaten anything that is common or, or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again is the second time what God hath cleansed. That call not thou uncommon. So here's a little a little addition to this. He wasn't just telling him to eat it. God was telling him that I've cleansed it. It's cool. I know how you've been trained and how I've taught you. But this I have cleansed. And so don't call this uncommon. And called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, should mean Behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, were lodged there. While Peter thought on the vision, the spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise, therefore, and get thee down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men which were sent unto him from Cornelius and said, Behold, I am he whom ye seek. What is the cause wherefore ye are come? And they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man, and one that feareth God, and of good report among all the nation of the Jews, was warned from God by an holy angel to send for thee into his house, and to hear words of thee. Then called he them in, and lodged them. And on the morrow Peter went away with them, and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. And the morrow after they entered into Caesarea. And Cornelius waited for them, and had called together his kinsmen and near friends. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter took him up, saying, Stand up, I myself also am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together. And he said unto them, Ye know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation? But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Well, now, did God not set up that training session? There it is. (laughs) (laughs) The great sensei himself, God Almighty, used food and the tradition to show this new turn in the gospel. At first... It was all about the Jews. And it makes sense. You got you, you want to save a people and, and set a people aside and make an example. I'm going to give you a blueprint. So the Jews become the blueprint of a loving and turbulent relationship <laughs> with God. 
but God does something. He adds this caveat that most of us don't get today. It's not just for you. See, I created the world, the Lord says. And I'm not here just to save the Jews. I'm here to save humanity. And so now, Peter is the one chosen to go outside of the fold and to reach out to the people that are normally, traditionally, all in water. We ain't supposed to talk with you. We ain't supposed to, to intermarry with you and so on. And the Lord gives Peter a vision. So be mindful, brothers and sisters, that in your walk with Christ, God could give you an additional direction. Not a new direction. An additional direction. You may be going north. I need you to do more northeast. Because God is doing a thing. And if you are so caught up on where you are in God right now, any new thing that he brings to you, you will miss. Any deviation, any, any, any addendum to the plan, you're going to miss it. So while we think we know where God wants us and we think we know God's plan for us, some of us, because some of us don't know what God wants from us. Some of us have not discovered our calling in the Lord. So we haven't we haven't begun to get on a mission in the name of the Lord right at this moment because we don't know yet. But some of us have heard a word from the Lord. And we've been moving in a direction. And God could politely want you to pick up 20 more people to put in that vehicle to keep it going. But if you're closed, if you know everything, if your cup is full, then there's nothing additional can be presented to you. So that is a um, something I think we should all, I think we, I, I personally believe we should always be in a place of not knowing. I, I I think we should always assume that there is more to be shared for God. God has more information than we could ever hold. So it would make sense that God is going to keep pouring into us. Pouring into us. So I think we need to be mindful of that. Anybody got anything on that? All righty then. Therefore came I unto you without gainsaying, as soon as I was sent for. I asked therefore, for what intent ye have sent for me? And Cornelius said, Four days ago I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing, and said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard, and thine alms are had in remembrance in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa, and call hither Simon, whose surname is Peter, he is lodged in the house of one Simon a tanner by the seaside, who when he cometh shall speak unto thee. Immediately therefore I send to thee, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now therefore are we all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. Peter comes to a revelation, gentlemen. He finally gets it. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, of a truth, because of this situation, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. And what does that mean? God does not hold one person in a higher esteem than the other. He doesn't hold one people in a higher esteem than the other. Because right now he is making the spiritual Israel. He's making the spiritual Jew that supersedes your biological makeup or your family tree, your genealogy. You have to get into this family tree through the spirit. 
So Peter's eyes are open. We are no better than them and they are no better than us. That word I say ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us, who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water? that these should not be baptized which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. Wow. Wow. Well, is this the introduction to the Gentiles? <laughs> you know? The church and the world. This is the representation here. The church and the world. There are still so-called church people who hold themselves in a higher esteem than those who have not been saved. And Peter saw the Holy Ghost fall on people who were not Jews. For the first time, Peter witnesses the Holy Spirit step outside of the Jews, the church, and enter into the Gentiles. That's a beautiful thing. Um, Humanity is what God is after. Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? So the Jews are now joined with the Gentiles as one body through the Holy Ghost. Um, anybody got anything on that before we, Dr. Stanley here? All right, you guys are quiet as mouses. I see everybody's writing everything down that's being said. And All right. <laughs> Here we go with Dr. Stanley, gentlemen. Here's today's In Touch devotion. Today's scripture reading begins in verse 42 of Acts chapter 10. And Jesus ordered us to preach to the people and solemnly to testify that this is the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. Of him all the prophets bear witness that through his name everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. Those of us who are believers know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, and at the end of time we will know him as our judge who rewards us for the things we've done in His name. But there seems to be a widespread misconception that God the Father will be our judge. However, John 5 verse 22 says, For not even the Father judges anyone, but He has given all judgment to the Son. Mm. Jesus has been given the right to judge our thoughts and actions. Christ is an impartial judge. 
he is not influenced by what others think or say. Rather, he determines what is right and good based on his honorable, just standard, which he gives us in his word. We'll be stripped of our worthless works, the actions and words we used for selfish ambition or vain conceit. Mm. All that will remain are the worthwhile things we thought, said, and did to honor God. These are the valuable parts of our life for which we will be rewarded. Reward is the whole point of placing believers before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. Shame and guilt over past sin and mistaken motivation have no place there. Our loving Savior is eager to show us our heavenly treasure. Christ will expose the real you at the judgment seat mm. by casting away the worthless things you've done. What remains will be a man or woman who endeavored to please the Lord. Let us determine to be powerful reflections of our Savior. All right. Um, anybody got anything on that? Um, I'm going to add to this incredible judge, Jesus Christ, or to the um, many um, verses that we read uh, leading up um, to this. Um, anybody? Any, any takers? If not... Hey, it's been a wonderful, wonderful uh, Bible study. I hope all were blessed and and received a good word from the Lord. Good word from the Lord. Until next time, everybody. God bless and pray for somebody. Being a superhero is bad for your health. Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate. And narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Tula, honey, bunny.